Welcome back to DIY Guitar Making. Today, I'm gonna answer your questions. We're gonna do a Q&A. It's been a little bit since we've done one of those. So, uh, let me give you some background on what I've been working on before we get into that. I've been working on the two parlor guitars. However, time is getting very, very tight. So, one of the parlor guitars, the Rosewood one, guitar number 87, I'm putting on the shelf for now, and I'm just going to keep on moving forward with guitar number 86, the Wangi guitar. There's no particular reason why I chose one over the other. I just had to trim it back to one guitar uh, in order to get it done in time, because for certain things I really do have sort of a hard or semi-hard finish date, shipping date, whatever you want to call it, ship date. And uh, after I finish, the that parlor guitar I have to get started on a an orchestra model guitar that I need to get done before the workshops the spring guitar build workshops begin by the way there are still two spots available which is actually very unusual this late into winter usually during the winter the spring workshops fill up very quickly but there's still two spots available so I just wanted to let you guys know if you are interested in getting into a nine day guitar building workshop here at Eric Schaefer Guitars with me, jump on one of those two spots. Or if you have a friend, uh, grab both of those spots. So that those two spots are in April, by the way. I'll put it up on the screen somewhere over here or over there uh, when I edit this video so you can see what those dates are. And uh, other than that, let's get right into your questions. How's that sound? Okay. So, girl's dad x times three, girl's dad times three, I'm a girl dad times one, so I can uh, relate, but um, you can relate by a factor of uh, three, and I can relate far less to being a girl dad. So your question is, great couple of videos, Eric. Thanks for sharing these. Any way you could post some close-up pictures of all these joints? He's talking about, by the way, uh, a two-part video I did on purfling miters is the most recent two videos that I just put out. They're really uh, good, if I do say so myself. Good deep dive into getting your purfling lines to turn at the point where it meets the end wedge and the back stripe and, and other things like that. And um, so there's a little background on that question. Let me, so what I can do for you, girl dad, is let me grab that guitar uh, i'm not going to take pictures of it to get really good crisp close-ups but i'm going to take it up over to the camera right now and explain a little bit of those joints because he's asking he says that he thinks it would be helpful to see exactly how they all come together so let me grab that guitar body all right so a couple of the let me spin this around a couple of the important points here that I was trying to get across in the video. For one is that we want the end wedge to be cut. You can pretty clearly see the joint between uh, where the end wedge ends and the ebony binding begins simply because uh, this piece of wood wasn't as dark of a piece of binding as this. But ordinarily if they are as dark often you can't even really tell where that line is. But as you can see there's clearly a joint right there and so the top of the end wedge is cut is lined up so that it ends right in line with the top of your white purfling strip there see that and then a little harder to see there is a joint between this piece and this piece right there that's called a butt joint when you just have two pieces um, where you just basically smush them together <laughs> that's a butt joint there's another one right down there another butt joint this one also pretty hard to see but it is there and same as at the top the binding uh, or the end wedge goes right to the top of the white strip there traveling to the back here you can see on that left uh, miter it's a little uh, sloppier let's say it's a you, you can see the miter itself there's a little thin black line between the two pieces 
So you can pretty clearly see how that was cut, uh, at least if you followed the two-part video series that I put out. That will help understand it. On the right side, you see a more uh, seamless example of how that's done. Okay? And so I think that covers it pretty well. Um, here's the top with all the dyed blue poplar. And there's a little joint there. You can see it's not perfect, but it's there. Okay, so there's your close-ups, girl dad. We'll just keep this right here for a little, um, for aesthetics, sit next to a guitar. Okay, let's see. Damn it, you are awesome. <laughs> Thank you, F. Mora. That's a, uh, damn it, you're pretty awesome too. Okay, uh, let's see. I am a rank amateur, not even that really, but the maker I have read most instructs the reader to build a work slash clamp board where there is a slight rise on one end. Thus, when building the face of the instrument, there is a modest decline toward the bridge, though the portion under the fretboard is mostly, is more flat. His explanation is that this feature counteracts the string tension somewhat and thus makes bowing over time less likely. So he, this was a comment on a video, a, an older video I did about the taper, why guitar bodies, I knew I kept this here for a reason, why guitar bodies are tapered. So this guitar body is actually thinner over here and fatter over here. And if I'm understanding what he's talking about there, he's actually talking about something that's ir irrelevant to the taper. Because the taper that I'm talking about really only exists on the back. As far as the geometry of how everything's laid out is concerned with the neck, all of that is actually independent of the back taper, okay? When you see a guitar body, the way that that taper is set is by making the neck block area on the back side shorter, essentially. And there's various ways that people make that happen. Um, what he's talking about is something entirely different. So um, I don't want to get too into that, into the weeds there. Just a little misunderstanding. Mark Husbands writes, I've been reluctant to use the tape on bearing thing because I worry about the tape coming off the slick bearing or little lumps. Guess I'm overthinking it. What he's talking about is a video, uh, part of that same video series, the two-part series on purfling miters. Uh, I gave a little tip for how I find an in-between size on my bearings, right? So, well, let me start over. If you have a binding tower set up for cutting your binding channels, the way that that works is you use a variety of bearing sizes. You, you purchase a set of bearings and the smaller bearings will give you a wider binding or purfling ledge, okay? And the larger bearings will give you a thinner binding or purfling ledge. So you have to find that sweet spot by swapping out those bearings to find what matches the strips that you intend to install on your guitar. And uh, the little trick that I use to get in between sizes, because very often you will find that one size is too big and, then, and the next size over is too small, right? So you want something that Goldilocks size right in between. And I take a piece of tape. I just use the same tape that I use for installing the binding for no particular reason because I have it because it's here, it's available. And I get it in these different sizes that Stu Max sells, just makes it easier. This really small size right here is perfect for putting on those bearings. Now what he's talking about, I actually agree with, and I thought the same thing before I ever started putting tape on the bearings. And I really do think it is just kind of overthinking it. Everything he's talking about, the little lumps uh, on the tape, especially where the tape potentially overlaps itself if you wrap it around a few times. Technically, the bearing should be 
slightly inconsistent then. Should be a little bit lumpy. The tape is soft. It's a soft material, so that also should affect um, or potentially leave some lumpiness there. All of that makes sense in theory, but I think the actual effect is so small as to be non-existent because in practice, it doesn't matter. So reasonable concerns, but just try it out and in practice, you'll find that it doesn't matter. He had also mentioned he was worried about the tape coming off. Keep in mind that when the bearing, so if you turn on your router, that bearing and the bit itself, everything's spinning, right? But the second that that bearing comes down and meets the sides, it doesn't spin. There's, the bearing is well lubricated. So there's no force trying to push or spin that bearing. It's actually just gently resting on the side. So that tape is not going to catch on something or heat up and, and fall apart. Um, I'd imagine that's why you're imagining that it could tear and fall apart. Another, another reasonable concern, but in practice, it's not an issue because the bearing, as all bearings are, is lubricated and it stops moving when it hits the sides. Nice tip on the true oil to help reduce chip out when routing. This is Keith Short, by the way, a uh, longtime common commenter. So great guy. Uh, I finished my instruments with UV Cure Finish. See, this is really interesting to me. I don't know anything about, uh, I've heard of UV Cured Finish, but I don't really know anything about it. So this is all new. Keith writes, I use it for the same purpose, reduce tear out, pre-routing. I wipe it on, then wipe off excess, then zap it to cure it. An advantage of my UV Goop is that it is odor free and cures in minutes. But I have a basement shop. Your windows would let in enough UV light to unexpectedly cure my goop. Okay. Well, I just wanted to share that, Keith. Uh, yes, my... <laughs> the, um, I get a lot of sunlight in here. and So, yeah, UV is probably off the table for me. Okay. Cool concept, though. DALG Guitars asks... Is that LMI white glue or Type Bond 1? I don't even know what video this is for, but it's Type Bond 1 because I always use Type Bond Original, which is the same as saying Type Bond 1. Uh, I use that for everything, unless I'm using cyanoacrylate glues, super glues, uh, for you know little inlays and things like that. That's the only case where I don't use Type Bond. And even sometimes I use Type Bond for inlays. It all depends. Okay, so here's a correction on a previous q and I had said that Charles Fox, that his guitar building school is in California, and DALG Guitars is informing me here that Charles Fox moved up to Oregon. All right, well, thank you for that. So if you guys are out in Oregon, you've got a guitar building school near you. You could also fly out to me. That'd be fun. Okay, uh, DALG Guitars... Looking forward to your thoughts on using Wangi on those beautiful little guitars. Uh, yeah, I'll pro um, that'll definitely be in the cards uh, to follow up when this is all done on my experiences with Wangi. I can tell you right now, it is splintery. It is super splintery. Um, I can't tell you how many times I've caught myself. I've learned to be very cautious around it. Uh, also coming along with the territory of being splintery is tear out, which if you guys have been following along, you have also seen uh, when I was routing out my end wedge and the binding channels and everything, there's it, definitely more of an, uh, just an inclination for it to rip out a chunk of wood when you're routing. So you gotta be careful. Okay, Paul Cuddy writes, uh, this is uh, on the topic of cutting acrylics. This is so informative and explained in simple terms very clearly. Thank you for sharing all this. Regarding acrylic cuts, yes, this is a problem to cut those sheets of ordinary acrylic, like six millimeters, around a quarter inch. They do melt on the bandsaw, and I know the mess you are describing. If you want to procure cast acrylic, I suspect this is not so easy in some places. For example, here in Switzerland, by the way, cast acrylic, I explained in the previous video, 
is the type of acrylic that you want to be using in the shop if you're using acrylic at all to make templates and things like that because it doesn't melt like he's describing. But now he's talking about the difficulty of procuring it. If you want to procure cast acrylic, I suspect this is not so easy in some places. For example, here in Switzerland. But the regular one is sold everywhere. I now switched to a jigsaw with a blade for metal, small, which means it has small teeth, on a low speed setting. It works quite well. Okay, so that's a good tip. There are also specialist blades, i.e. the Bosch T101A, and you can cool with a water spray if you need to cut faster. Although he writes that he didn't try the water spray yet. The blade for metal and low speed was enough for me. My bandsaw also has a lower speed to cut metal. I will try that one time, but to be honest, I am lazy and grabbing the jigsaw is much easier. And if you need to make closed inside cuts, no way with the bandsaw. Okay, well thank you, Paul Cuddy. Uh, that uh, is very helpful, uh, especially for people who can't find cast acrylic but if you can find cast acrylic just go with that and you won't have this problem but it's good to know uh, for example that using a metal blade with finer teeth that that problem will at least be mitigated okay man you guys suddenly started commenting on my beard a whole lot here I used to have a red beard but now that I'm 69 years old it's mostly gray Thanks, Redbeard. Eric, that beard is glorious. <laughs> I, I don't know if I suddenly reached, you know, I would assume it, it's an emergent property when your beard suddenly becomes glorious, but judging by how you guys are reacting to it, it seems like I've crossed, crossed a very fine threshold and suddenly now everyone notices. Um, <laughs> But I like that being Redbeard. That's that's fun. It's a good name. Mm, there's a speeder out there. LC Guitars, which is uh, Robert Livingston out in um, like the Bedford area of Pennsylvania. He took my course in. Oh man, uh, it was a while ago. I'm gonna guess like. 2017 or something like that. LC Guitars writes, I have recently, the last year, switched to Luminlay side dots. Depending on the color of the binding you can get, the glow material in a white plastic tube or black plastic tube. They are plastic, but the glow is outstanding. Don't fall for the cheap knockoff brands. All right, cool. Yeah, I've never tried anything like that. Uh, it's definitely something you see more commonly on electric guitars, which uh, LC Guitars makes electric guitars primarily. But that is pretty cool. Lumen Lay is the brand. Lumen Lay, pretty cool. Jason Starbird writes, thanks for the info. I'm getting ready to bend my first set. I'm using Paduk, so I think I'll shoot for about 80 thousandths of an inch and see how that goes. Uh, yeah, 80. 80 is actually a really good number to shoot for. You could probably do 85. I wouldn't really go more than that. And I wouldn't go less than, than 80 in this case. 75 would be the most. So 80, 80 puts you right in the sweet spot, honestly. Aim for that. Very good. Watch and Learn uh, is asking a question based on a video I did about bending the side purfling which the side purfling gets glued to the binding strips and then placed in my side bender just like a set of sides does. Um, and that purfling strip is glued with just regular old tight bond. And so Watch and Learn is asking, how do you stop the two pieces from delaminating from the heat since the maple is glued to the ebony? And the answer to that question, I had that same question too when I was first started doing it this way and I just tried it um, kind of under the assumption that it, yes, it actually would delaminate, and I do believe it does, but because it's held fast be between the rollers and the 
shoe, the waist shoe that presses it down, and the thick spring steel that makes up the bending sandwich. Between all of that, everything's held in the position that you um, held tightly against the mold, I'll say. And so even though it, the glue definitely does warm up from the heat and probably delaminates, it still holds its position so it doesn't just kind of fall apart. And then that glue, re, uh, I'm assuming, just re-hardens again and, and everything's okay when you take it out. And I know that it does delaminate at least a little bit because I did have, I do sometimes, very, very rarely, but every once in a while I'll pull those out of the bender and I'll have one, in fact, I have it lying around, so I'm gonna show you. I'll have occasionally, like one out of every 10 times I use the bender like this, I will have a piece where uh, the purfling has separated from it in a way that makes it unusable. So you can see here, this piece is mostly good, but when we get to the middle here, that has completely not only separated, but separated and warped and twisted because it's such a thin material. So I can't really save that and get that back together without, not without a lot of effort at least. And here it, it has done sort of a different thing. It delaminated and then was able to pull apart and then the glue rehardened. So that can't simply be pushed back into place. So this piece is ruined. But this is rare. This, at least with my system, this doesn't really happen. And I would assume this happened uh, just because maybe it was on the outside of the... So when I set them up, I have a whole row of bending strips all laid out together. Maybe this one was towards the outside. And uh, I don't know, it just wasn't as um, sort of sandwiched together as the pieces towards the inside. So yeah, that's a good question. It does delaminate, but it still works out in the end. I've done this, by the way, before with uh, cyanoacrylate glue and had the same results, meaning it, it worked with the cyanoacrylates too. So it seems to not really matter too much what glue you use but I like using tight bond for this. What glue do you use on the binding strips? Uh, I just answered that, so tight bond. Driven LP writes, I always put my frets in a cup of acetone and set them aside, agitating periodically to clean off the oil used in manufacturing the fret wire. It might not matter, but that's what I do. Yeah, so he's talking about the fret wire. I mean, this is good to know. Fret wire gets shipped to you with a little bit of oil coating its surface because that's how it is best stored. Uh, it's metal, so it's very easy for something like that to rust if you didn't put a little bit of oil on it. Um, so before you install your fret wire, it's a good idea to remove that oil. I just wipe it with a paper towel and that's I I would I have I've had no issues with it so that seems to be good enough for me uh, but yeah he's saying he's agitates it he puts it in a cup of acetone the only reason I don't like that and to each his own honestly I'm not you know picking on this guy at all but uh, acetone is so freaking nasty I mean it's just it it's just the way it the fumes come up. I mean, it's super caustic stuff. I don't even, I, I don't want to get it on my hands. I don't want to smell it. And um, so, you know, having to fill a whole cup or even, you know, I'm sure he's not filling the whole cup, but having to create a little reservoir of acetone and then put your oil into it. Uh, I mean, maybe if you're doing it, you know, I'm just assuming he's wearing gloves and all of that. It just seems like a lot of sort of safety precautions are necessary and, and, and a lot of you know risk you're taking to your general health for something that is, I think, unnecessary. All you have to do is wipe the oil off with naphtha. And in that way, um, yeah, you're just not dealing with something so caustic. Okay, well, that's it.
I think we covered a lot there and uh, look forward to more of your questions. Please throw them at me. Um, I'm really enjoying doing these longer Q&As and I think we'll keep it up. If you guys want to sign up for those two last remaining spots, just go to ericschaferguitars.com. That's for the nine day acoustic guitar building workshop where we build an orchestra model size guitar. This is a parlor size, so something quite a bit bigger than this. We will build a flat top acoustic guitar together. In those nine days, you will end up with a fully functional, playable, very playable guitar in the white, as they say, which means without finish. And I give you instructions for applying a true oil finish at home when you take your instrument home. Um, so yeah, the, those last two remaining spots are in April. And then there's also a whole nother class session in the fall. I'll be doing three or four classes then. You can see the schedule of dates for the fall workshops as well at ericschaferguitars.com. Okay, guys, I am going to get to work or continue work on the neck, the neck carve for this Wangi guitar right here. So uh, I'm not really sure if I'm... I might do this without creating a, a video for neck carving just to kind of get ahead here because like I said, I am falling behind. Uh, so you might not see a video on that, but if you don't see a video on that, you'll probably see a video on fitting the neck or something like that in the very near future. All right, guys. Bye for now. If you learned something here, please give this video a like and subscribe so you can be notified when I release a new DIY guitar making video. And if you want to really learn more, take one of my structured online courses at ericschaferguitars.com or register for a hands-on guitar building workshop here with me in Burnville, Pennsylvania.